In the past few decades, seaborne trade has been integral to the economic growth of Asia, but China's naval expansion is seen as a threat to the interests of many Asian and Southeast Asian countries as PLA Navy is developing military bases in the South China Sea, Western Pacific and Eastern Indian Ocean. From the Indian point of view, securing trade flows in Indian Ocean region is crucial. Around 80% of all seaborne trade in oil passes through the IOR. To understand how can China be countered by the global powers to make the region safe from military threats arising out of China. TOI spoke to retired Commodore C. Uday Bhaskar. My feeling is that China is not going to in any way harm or cause any kind of damage to commercial traffic because China itself is dependent on the safety and stability of the sea lines of communication globally. So I don't think personally that China would take recourse to such an action. But what the installations have done is that they have allowed China to install equipment that gives it a certain advantage, both for surveillance, which is to monitor the movement of any platform ships, both on the surface and underwater, if need be. And also, I think they can position certain military ordnance, whether it's in the form of missiles or any other armament, and use it for an offensive operation if such an exigency arises. But at the moment, as I said, I do not see any danger to commercial traffic. But in the very unlikely event that one of the ASEAN countries decides to take any kind of military action to either reclaim or reject the Chinese position on the artificial installations, or they call them islands, then I think the current fortification of PLA capability on these artificial islands would be of advantage to China in a tactical situation. Well, as I said, it could be below the median. You know, when we talk about low intensity conflict, it is something that India is very familiar with. So you can have a kind of level of violence, which is not like a traditional war. So it is called as low intensity conflict. It's below the median of traditional war, but it can cause a fair amount of anxiety as far as the security dimension is concerned. And differently, over the last five to seven years, particularly since 2016, when the International Tribunal Award was rejected by China, we have seen, as I said, these fishing vessels of Vietnam, of Indonesia, of Malaysia, Philippines being either intimidated or attacked. In one case, they were even sunk by the Chinese maritime militia. Now, this is a new kind of development where perhaps one could even use the term hybrid warfare whereby it may not be the PLA Navy vessels, that is the Chinese Navy, but the Chinese militia, the maritime militia. China has taken this particular route or path to intimidate its immediate neighbors in ASEAN. But this may not work with the larger countries. You know, for instance, with the United States, where there have been instances of tension, particularly when the US Navy has carried out the phone ops, freedom of navigation operations, or they have used their aircraft to fly over what China claims is its own territory because of the SCS. It has not been able to intimidate the United States in this manner. So I think this is a kind of very complex signaling that is going on, where China on one hand is increasing its maritime military capability, its trans-border military capability by way of aircraft, by way of missiles and so on. Two things here, number one, Australia and Japan independently at this point in time do not have the capability, in my view, to achieve what you might call as a military asymmetry in their favor if they were to have an engagement with China across the spectrum. But yes, you're right, both these countries are members of the Quad. And if you look at the 
combined military capability or i would even say the combined maritime capability of the quad nations united states japan australia and india then definitely they would be able to have a superior military capability in a combined fashion but at the same time i want to clarify again that the quad has not projected itself as a military alliance at the moment these are four countries that have a certain degree of shared interest in relation to the maritime domain the one principle they uphold is respect and sanctity of international law that is why they have all come together and they are trying to forge a partnership and yes there is a political diplomatic signal also in the fact that these four countries have come together there was a summit level meeting of the quad where the same sentiment was expressed but we are also aware that none of the four quad countries want to get into a military confrontation with china and ditto china does not want to be pushed into a military confrontation with one or all four now this was reflected most recently in the brief meeting between the us president mr joe biden and the chinese president his counterpart mr xi jinping when they met on the sidelines of the g20 summit and the sense that was conveyed is that neither side wants to push for any kind of military confrontation whether it's over taiwan or the south china sea dispute did not come up in a big way so i don't think that's a valid point but definitely on taiwan so therefore the quad countries are aware that there is a different track between us and china and there is a different track for the other bilaterals but the very fact that the quad causes concern as far as beijing is concerned to my mind is a signal by itself but then china is also doing something similar particularly when it comes to the indian ocean well at the moment i think there has been some kind of i would say murmur not even formal talks about whether or not individual asean countries would like to partner with the quad as a group there are partnerships going on bilaterally i mean it's a bit like saying indonesia has an interaction independently with the united states it has it with japan it has it with australia because indonesia is the largest country as far as the asean is concerned so do the smaller states india and singapore have a very robust maritime and military naval relationship so the bilateral track is quite i would say active but whether asean as a collective of 10 nations wants to formally partner with the quad i think is a question mark the reason is asean itself is divided now there are some countries that are in a way more oriented towards china they would not like to do anything to upset the so called chinese position on either the south china sea dispute or any of the other strategic and security related issues now cambodia for instance has been very sensitive to chinese concerns that's one country similarly the smaller countries which are differently dependent on beijing for instance in the past this used to be said of myanmar but now myanmar is also evolving its own foreign policy and security policy so nothing can be taken for granted but the larger point is that there is no visible consensus amongst all 10 nations in the asean about whether they would like to take a collective position and in a way offer some kind of alternate position that would be seen to be in opposition to china i don't think that's going to happen and therefore we have to track the bilaterals and in some cases the plurilaterals you know two or three asean countries might get together and perhaps engage with the quad in a non military activity yes my sense is that india can play a role and it's already very clear that india is the lead nation as far as the indian ocean is concerned the other three quad nations that is united states japan and australia have a greater i would say profile and footprint as far as the western pacific is concerned but if you look at the entire indo pacific as a continuum you know where you have both the indian ocean and the pacific and the whole strategic construct of the indo pacific i think india can play a role and it is acknowledged that india has a certain credibility 
when it comes to both the maritime domain and i would say international diplomacy and this goes back to the 1950s when we had the korean war where if you remember india played a fairly i would say significant role in handling the korean war crisis and when we had the three nation commission that was set up outside of the un to look into this particular issue and help to diffuse the tensions so that's what i mean by pedigree but in this particular case the south china sea has got primarily a, you know it's a multi layered dispute the first layer is regional which is to say that there are three or four different bilaterals say for instance china and philippines they went the uh, philippines took manila took the case to the international tribunal malaysia has its own track with china on the bilateral so does vietnam now indonesia also has had some maritime discord with china in the past that is the bilateral track then there is a asean and china which is at a second level so which is why china is engaged with all the 10 asean countries and they are trying to evolve a code of conduct and science china is keen to stabilize the scs of the south china sea dispute with the asean countries both bilaterally and collectively and keep external powers say for instance like the united states out of the dispute but the asean countries are also very uncomfortable with china and its military assertiveness so this is where the role of countries like india which is a major maritime power in the indian ocean come into play because what india says would carry some weight